a school night, as they say, to come with us and talk about disinformation. I think it's an incredibly critical topic. It has been addressed um, in the United States in popular media, really in terms of this term, which I hate, fake news, um, because it's of course been appropriated um, to mean something different from what it originally meant. But I think it's really important that the French Embassy has organized this discussion to talk about it beyond the question of what we think and what we believe, um, you know, what side we're on politically, but how it actually can affect the very core of democratic institutions. How as people lose trust in institutions, including the media, um, we lose trust in our political officials, we lose trust in our um, in our government in general, and how this can wear away at the fabric of democracy. And we've seen many efforts, not only with our own 2016 election efforts that the US intelligence agencies say were led by Russia to interfere with our election, but the French election, of course, there were attempts made which failed, and we'll talk tonight about why the 2016 election in the US uh, it, why it was possible to have interference by the Russians and what the French did differently and what we um, humble people in the U.S. can learn from the French example and the German example and some others where um, government officials, state actors were more aware and more able to uh, fend off these attacks. So I want to begin first by going through with our panelists, and we have, you're incredibly lucky to have here, um, you know, these three, to be able to give you the perspective. John Lansing, of course, from what used to be called the Broadcasting Board of Governors, but is now called newly the U.S. Agency for Global Media. Um, a lot of people think of this as a government agency, yes, but in fact, the media, the the journalism product that you produce is done completely independently. It's not an arm of the government. It's not state media in the way that Pravda was state media um, in the Soviet Union. So it might be helpful to just explain a little bit first how you see disinformation. Tell us in the American context, our, your content, of course, which is created by VOA and many other um, you know, adjuncts, of um, US agency for global media is not broadcast in the United States, it's broadcast overseas. Um, what do you say to those who say disinformation, misinformation? I mean, we're putting out propaganda too, which is of course what critics of VOA say. Yeah. Thank you, Indira, and, and thanks to the Embassy of France for hosting us here. It's an honor to be with such a great ally um, and the allies we have on the stage. Uh, we, we don't do propaganda for a simple reason, because the number one thing that we're exporting to the world is credibility. That our journalism is independent, and it's independent because the statute that created Voice of America and Radio Free Europe uh, made it illegal for the government to interfere in the independent editorial decision making of our journalists and the leaders of our various news networks. And that's important because to be believable around the world, as I said, we have to be credible. And to be credible, we have to be truthful. And that line is actually something I'm quoting from Edward R. Murrow from 1961. And it really is the mantra of what we stand for. And increasingly, um, I, I had the honor to, to meet with Senator McCain about a year before he got sick. And he said this in a, in a meeting along with one of my board members, Ambassador Ryan Crocker, and he wasn't kidding. He said that the current attack on democratic institutions, whether in France, in the United States, or anywhere, is literally an act of war. And he, he wasn't kidding. He wasn't being euphemistic. He, he really meant it. And so it's true. It's become an information battlefield. And unfortunately, propagandists have a bit of an advantage because the goal of a propagandist say, Vladimir Putin, is to destroy the very idea that empirical facts even exist. Because in their eyes, if you can destroy the idea of, of, a, of a set of facts that foes and opponents have to agree upon, then the biggest liar can win the game. And so we're playing a game of truth against lies. And it really ties a hand around it around our back, and often somebody, even on Capitol Hill, will say to me, you know, why don't we do what the Russians are doing? And I have to keep 
hammering home that if we did what the Russians were doing, we'd be playing exactly into their hands. We would help them prove that there's no such thing as the truth. And so our number one job is to seek the truth, just like you do in your journalism work, your great work through the years, is seek the truth, tell the truth, and hold people accountable to the truth. And if people don't like that, then that's not unusual or unknown to me. I've done this for a long time. But ultimately, our institutions require that there be an agreed upon set of truths so that you can't have a foreign government or somebody within our own country that could really, really just undercut everything we believe about what makes a democracy work. Well, I don't want to get too political here, but when you talk about the notion of Vladimir Putin trying to undercut objective truth, you know, what is real and what is not, I mean, this is, of course, the playbook that we've seen from many authoritarian leaders um, throughout the world and also throughout the decades. It is maybe a favorite tactic of the 20th century and early 21st century, but it existed a long time ago, um, long before we had the internet or television anyway. But that the problem is, of course, that it becomes political when we have the, our own president um, saying, you know, black is white, that's not true, you know, and trying to discredit the media, the American mainstream media, and say you're all liars, you're all fake news. I mean, that puts you in a difficult position as well, because to have our own president undercutting the credibility of independent reporting, Voice of America, Radio Free Asia, Radio Free Europe, these are all independent journalistic institutions. He doesn't pick on them specifically, but by undercutting the press in general, it's not just an attack on press freedom, it's an attack on what we think of as truth. And then people think, oh, well, I can really believe him. I can't believe you know, the sources of information that I'm getting. Yeah. Does that concern you? Well, it does put me in an uncomfortable position. I have to agree with that. Well, here, here's the thing. Um, I agree that it isn't a good thing for our leaders to undercut the idea of the value of a free press. But at the same time, we're also reporting on it around the world. And so you're around the world, Voice of America, Radio Free Europe, we're reporting on our administration and we're fact checking our own administration in a way that doesn't happen in places that don't have a free press. And so, in a sort of an ironic twist, it gives us a way to give a stark example of why democracies are different, because they still, even when the leader of the democracy is criticizing the press, we still report about that and we fact check what's being said, and then we broadcast that to the world. I want to come back to this whole issue of truth and trust and reality, because we can have an entire conversation about public distrust in the media, which predates the specific misinformation, disinformation campaign that came from Russia in the 2016 campaign. As you well know, um, trust, public trust in the U.S. media has been falling since the late 70s, and there are a whole host of reasons for that, although in just the last two years after the 2016 election, public trust in, in the news media has actually been inching up. Um, which is interesting, suggesting that President Trump's attacks on the media may be actually background. We can come back to that. But I want to move on to Jean-Baptiste to ask you the sort of elephant in the room question. And I think there's very little understanding in this country about, about why what worked on us, what, you know, the Russian disinformation campaign worked in 2016. And by worked, I don't mean got a specific result, because I don't think the Russians were even necessarily trying to get Trump elected. From all we know, they didn't actually think he would be elected, but they wanted to sow confusion, sow doubt, discredit Hillary Clinton so there would be a cloud above her, etc. I think they were quite surprised that Donald Trump won. Why is it that attempts to um, sow influence in the in the French election, specifically with the hacked emails of Emmanuel Macron, failed in France? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Uh, uh, I think we should get back um, uh, on what happened first uh, in the 2017 French election. Um, so what happened was both a disinformation campaign against the candidate Macron, um, false remorse, um, uh, that culminated, for example, in uh, one episode that was called Hashtag Macron Gate, 
two fake documents suggesting that he had an offshore bank account, secret offshore bank account. That and which was true? It, it was, it was uh, false, obviously, and it was proved to be, uh, to be false uh, quite quickly, actually. So, disinformation campaign, that's quite uh, classic. And then, in parallel, you had cyber attack with a hacking of um, uh, the uh, email inboxes of uh, five of its closest collaborators, um, and then the release of nine gigs of data, including more than 20,000 emails, um, only 48 hours before the uh, last round, the last vote, uh, trying to influence the, uh, the vote. So that's what happened. Then there is the issue contribution we can get back to that. It was not formally officially attributed, but all the experts are pointing uh, to the same direction. Um, to so, Russia. Yeah, to Russia. So, um, most specifically to the GAU, which is the, the military intelligence. Um, so what, um, why did it fail in the case of France, and why not in the case of, of the US? So in the report that we just released, um, we study this, uh, this case, and we find that it's a combination of four factors. Uh, one is uh, structural reasons. There are structural reasons. Then luck, then good preparation, then good reaction. So this, the structural reasons, are uh, that the, the political ecosystem is not the same in, uh, in France. It's a direct election of the president, which makes it more obvious, which, which makes any attack more obvious. So no electoral college. No, no electoral college. Um, then we have a two-round election, so it makes it more difficult for the attacker to know who will be at the second and last round. In that case, Macron was not obvious, actually. Um, so political ecosystem is not the same. A media ecosystem is not the same. Uh, we rely more on mainstream media and less on conspiracy websites, like in, which are pretty popular in the US, or tabloid style uh, media outlets, which are pretty popular in the UK. Uh, so there is a general trust in mainstream media. Um, and uh, so these are the, the uh, structural reasons. Then luck, because- But also you didn't mention the press blackout, the 48 hour press blackout yes, right. law, which we do not have here. Maybe you can explain that. Exactly. So um, 48 hours before the votes, you cannot uh, use the press to make any uh, political comments on, uh, on the election. Uh, so the candidates cannot communicate anymore, and the press cannot uh, you know, try to influence the voters in any way 48 hours before. But that obviously does not apply or incorrectly apply to the digital platforms, and that's another issue that we should discuss. But it begs the question of why those emails, which were clearly meant to damage Macron, were released just before, if they had least released them a week earlier, is it possible that it would have influenced the election? Because of when they released them, the press didn't report on them. Plus, Macron's campaign had intentionally seeded in there fake emails. So when they were released, they were able to say, well, you know, we knew that we were gonna get hacked, so we put a bunch of fake emails in there, and the press kind of said, okay. Whereas in the United States, I don't think the press would have said okay to that. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Um, but at the same time, it, it all depends on the content of the emails. And in that case, they were revealing nothing interesting. Uh, so there were nothing especially scandalous uh, or interesting uh, in, uh, in, in the email about Macron's campaign. Uh, it was pretty normal stuff uh, about uh, you know, normal uh, political campaign. There was nothing illegal that was found in the emails. Um, so the content of the email was not really interesting. Uh, I guess the intent was just to hack and release this email to sow doubt. Uh, maybe not about the content, but about a potential stuff that we could find theoretically, but we don't have to, to check because we have only 48 hours and we don't have time for that. Um, so they just probably presumed that releasing would be enough, uh, even though the content was not interesting, and that was a mistake. It's why I'm saying luck, because they were kind of amateurish in the attack. Then good preparation, and we benefited from the fact that we got hit after the US, and after the UK, and after the Dutch referendum, and after Germany. So we learned from all the previous cases. We benefited from intelligence attacks. Um, so there are all kinds of reasons why we were, were prepared or better prepared. Uh, also in the case of the US, um, the Obama administration did not intervene because it did not want to appear advantageous on one side. 
against the other, in that case Clinton, and also because they believed it was not possible to lose the election. They did not believe in the possibility that Trump could win. Where in France, we were not in the same configuration uh, at all, and we have uh, an independent administration that is the both actually two, that is one the Electoral Commission and the other the ANSI, which is the Cyber Security Agency. And they can intervene in that case without appearing advantage in one side uh, and not the other. So the, the configuration is not the same. And then they reacted well when it happened by making it public uh, that they were attacked. Um, and even, as you mentioned, reacting, um, uh, you know, they, when, as soon as they knew they were going to be attacked, they faked some of these emails. So it's pretty audacious. It's, um, it's very audacious. It's very audacious. It's like big the hackers at, at their own game. Uh, it's when you know you're going to be hacked and your emails are going to be released, not only you don't write anything interesting in the emails, but write fake emails, ridiculous stuff. Then if you do that, at the end, what's released are three things. Authentic emails, emails forged by the attackers because they did so, and emails forged by the victims. And then it's such a mess that the public don't, you know, uh, give any credibility to the entire uh, leak, and they're not, they're not able to distinguish. But that's the French public versus the American public. There are plenty of people in the American public who would have given credibility to the fake emails because they would have been convinced by whatever Reddit thread um, they were on that those emails were right. I mean, just in the past 48 hours, we've seen all sorts of new conspiracies crop up. People who said that Michael Avenatti had been duped by Fortune, who said that's completely not true. There was a real person, as it turned out. He wasn't duped by Fortune, but there are a lot of people who believe a lot of conspiracies here. And yeah. Maybe we need some sociologists up on the stage to explain <laughs> to us the difference between the American psyche and the French one. But it's also true that journalism learned something from the US example in 2016, and from what we didn't know at the time was also um, influence on the Brexit election as well, very much so. Um, but what we learned was, wait a second, fact-checking is really important, real-time fact-checking is important, and getting out there really aggressively and saying what the truth is. So in fact, a group was formed, Depayan sits next to the woman who was behind it um, at his office at the Shorenstein Center at Harvard, but CrossCheck, which was a project um, between British fact-checkers, French fact-checkers, to really heavily blanket we at Pointer, I was the ethics chair at Pointer for the last year and a half, and we at Pointer, which is the home of the International Fact-Checking Network and PolitiFact, were heavily involved in that. And so there was like active 24-hour around-the-clock fact-checking going on of the French election in a way that wasn't as popular at the time of the American election in 2016. Depayan, you have a, a unique and interesting perspective to bring, which is that you were actually in the industry. You worked for a large platform company, and you can tell us about that, and why is it challenging for platform companies to control disinformation, misinformation? And I ask you that because certainly at Pointer, my view was how, you know, now that you see what has happened, and it, again, this is not at all about the result of the 2016 election, it's simply about the fact that there was interference. Um, set aside the result, why can't Facebook, why can't these platforms do something about it as soon as they see the misinformation, disinformation, cut off those accounts and not amplify it through the algorithm? Uh, well, I think it's, <laughs> first of all, let me just say it's, it's an honor to be here and I'm, I'm happy to be here uh, and talk about these issues. This is a, this is a tremendously important uh, issue that cuts to the heart of, uh, of American and French democracy. Um, I think that it's a, it's a tremendously challenging problem for companies like Facebook, and Facebook's not alone. Facebook, Google, Twitter uh, are kind of in the same boat uh, in the sense that they are they're large two-sided platforms where information is shared by the crowd and the crowd can consume it. Uh, things can go viral, things might not go viral, um, but there's there's very uh, there's ultimate control uh, from from the individual user over whether or not content gets published on their account. 
Um, and that's that's kind of the commonality that, that these three companies and the, and the major platforms that they host share. Um, so I think that the main problem from them, for them, uh, from a technical perspective, is the scale. Uh, Facebook has uh, almost 2.5 billion users. Um, Messenger, the, the popular That's internet. It's bigger than any country, if we think about it in that way. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, bigger than the two biggest countries in the world, you could say. Um, so, it's, so it's a problem of scale. How do you uh, create an operation, even using the, the latest technologies available today in artificial intelligence and machine learning, how do you create a technical, technological operation that can track everything that's happening on your platform in real time and assess whether or not it's true and, uh, and, and make a determination as to whether or not it should stay online or whether or not it should be flagged uh, red flagged for the for the eventual viewer, or whether or not it should just be uh, taken down. Um, so that's that's the technical problem of scale. Um, there is an argument that this problem of scale is something that's uh, achievable, uh, something that the industry can do. If we think about Facebook, Facebook has uh, tremendously huge profit margins. Uh, it's a it's a cash rich company. It basically is a website uh, that, that shows a digital ad and, and collects money for it. And, uh, and, and that means that, uh, especially given its, its low operating cost, uh, it, it makes a lot of money. Um, and uh, it, it invests a lot of that capital in technological projects, including in artificial intelligence, to uh, create a better news feed, uh, to create a more seamless uh, operation in, in Messenger, um, to uh, enhance all of its leading you know, platforms and products from WhatsApp to, to Oculus to everything coming down the pipe. And so it's investing heavily in artificial intelligence as are all of these companies. Why can't they invest in a, a more robust operation to cut out disinformation from their platform? Well, I think that it's uh, in their eye, I think that it's about their commercial interest. It's the, it's we have to strike straight to the to the heart of the economic logic behind the consumer internet. Uh, when I say the consumer internet, again, I'm talking about these popular companies that that we use. Um, when we uh, when we think about the economic logic, the business model is very simple. The business model is to create a tremendously compelling. Uh, application, like the news feed or the Twitter feed, uh, or YouTube uh, recommendations, let's say. Uh, second, to collect data in an unchecked manner on each individual, so that you can create behavioral data profiles on each individual. Uh, third, uh, to, to develop, in an ongoing way, uh, tremendously sophisticated algorithms that do two things. Um, target advertisements and curate content in the newsfeed or whatever uh, social media product we're talking about. Um, and that business model is, is built so as to benefit the interests of the clients of these companies, which are advertisers. And up until 2016, these companies were simply not doing anything about whether or not their clients, the people paying them money and, and from, from uh, who were contributing to their, to their revenues, they were not doing anything to assure whether or not uh, advertisers had legitimate interests or nefarious interests. And, and so to, to actually cut them out of the, of the process entirely would, you could say, go against the commercial interests of, of the leading companies that we're talking about. So I think, I think the challenges are both technical and, and commercial. I think you're exactly right, and I think the commercial ones became very clear when journalists and fact-checkers were asking Facebook in particular to give us access to their API for us to understand how fake news, and I mean that in the original sense, meaning false information, hoax stories that aren't true, how that information spread, and they were very unwilling to do it, and I think it's because they give that up, they give up their secret sauce. And their effort, of course, is to keep people engaged on their platform as long as possible, to be collecting that data, to be bombarding them with ads, etc. 
And that also feeds into the notion of these so-called echo chambers or filter bubbles, that if you know that somebody is politically conservative or politically liberal or they love animals or whatever their thing is, then if you keep that causes the algorithm to raise more content that they like, that they engage with, um, and tends to you know, magnify that side. So that then, I think what we discovered from the research was that people, very animated people on the right and the left, were being blinded to other points of view because what Facebook was elevating for them was more and more and more of the stuff they had clicked on, and they had a sort of twisted, distorted view of what the reality was in the whole ecosystem. So let me ask you, to that end, what has your thought been about how Facebook has dealt with or not dealt with the banning of individuals <coughs> such as Alex Jones of InfoWars and Jerome Corsi and other people who have spread very noxious and nefarious conspiracy theories, um, including you know claiming that Sandy Hook or that Parkland, that these, that these massacres of children, that, that they never happened and that those were crisis actors? Uh, well, uh, I think the short answer is not very well. They have not handled these situations very well. Um, but uh, I think that they've handled them in a way that suits their interests. Again, going back to their commercial interests. Um, it's, it's a very difficult situation for these companies to, deter to make determinations as to whether or not something constitutes disinformation or hate speech or, let's say, even uh, at the borderlines of nudity uh, anything that, uh, that might constitute a violation of their content policy um, in a novel way uh, is something that these companies don't want to approach because they don't want to say that, yeah, we're the arbiter of truth and we think that's, tr that's right and that's wrong. Um, they don't want to they don't wanna say that, uh, yes, we think that, uh, let's say Richard Spencer, a, a far-right activist in, 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 the, in the United States, uh, we think that uh, uh, he is, is, is promulgating hate speech. They don't want to make these kinds of determinations because when that determination is made by the company, let's say by Facebook or Twitter, that means they're falling somewhere on a spectrum and everybody on the wrong side of that spectrum is going to resent the company for it. Everybody on the, who is pushing for Alex Jones to be taken off the platform will then say, well, why didn't you do this a lot earlier? And so none of these companies want to be in these kinds of situations. This is, the, this is the core problem in content moderation, whether we're talking about hate speech or disinformation uh, in, in the French context or the US context or, or uh, any, any democracy. And uh, I think that that is, that is a tremendously challenging problem for the industry. And I think the solution lies in having third parties tell the industry. Uh, where it should fall on these kinds of decisions. Uh, that's what the industry wants. It wants those kinds of policies determined by third parties so that they can shift the responsibility away from Silicon Valley and shift it onto the Boston Globe or shift it onto uh, the, the French government or the US government. Um, yeah. You use the term content moderation, which is of course a term of art in the industry. So to explain that, it means you know who's looking at the content that is appearing on the platform and deciding thumbs up or thumbs down on spreading it. Um, what I think one problem with content moderation is not enough humans in the game. When you have algorithms and machines, which is understandable if you have more than two billion people in this Facebook nation community, you can't have enough editors to be looking at every piece of content. But the downside of that is that then certain things get flagged and taken off the platform and banned. And I'm thinking of the famous award-winning Vietnam War photo of the girl in the My Lai Massacre running naked through the street because of Agent Orange. And that was taken down from Facebook as child porn, which of course it's not child porn. It's an important award-winning Vietnam War photo. And yet other people who have said horrible things to people on Facebook like, you know, your child never died, those people are allowed to stay on and on and on. So I think for the industry, as you say, to want to put it off on third parties, you're absolutely right, but they're really eschewing a moral responsibility. They're not playing their part. And what they did, for example, with Pointer is they said, we want you, International Fact Checking Network, to be to organize the third party fact checkers. 
but then they didn't give the third party fact checkers the power to actually take down content. All the third party fact checker could do would be to flag content saying this is untrue or that is suspicious, but it still appeared in people's feeds and Facebook didn't share publicly the information of how much the flagging of false information with third party fact checkers had actually reduced the sharing, um, the onward sharing of those. John, let me ask you, um, you know, it, it feels as if it's not just the Russians who are trying to interfere in our election. Um, Donald Trump has been talking nonstop for the last couple of weeks since he decided to put more tariffs on China about China. He's now claiming that China interfered in the 2016 election and that China's trying to interfere in, uh, in our midterms. I know we can't litigate that up here and that's not your role, but where are the threats? And how does your agency as a sort of producer of news that goes outside of the U.S. that's meant to be credible, how do you address these threats? Well, it's, it's a great question. Uh, you know, Freedom House, and I'm sure you're aware of this, came out with their report this year that only 13% of the population of the planet Earth lives in a place that has a free and open press. And it's gotten worse steadily over the last seven years. It, it, Where do we fall? Not number one. <laughs> Who's number one? Oh, I think it's one of the like, Scandinavian. Yeah, Scandinavia. yes. um, but it, it's like a virus spreading around the world. Uh, these dictators, whether it's Hun Sen in Cambodia, whether it's what's going on in Poland, uh, what's going on in Turkey with Erdogan. Um, I mean, in that in that case, it's a you know a NATO country. Um, you're seeing the press being Poland too. Poland too. Um, we had a deep dive today on Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan. You know, we had three experts in, in with a group of people similar to this and said that the media in Pakistan is diverse, but it's not free, that the media is complicit with the government, um, which gets to a point about Facebook and that 23 is the median age for 200 million people in Pakistan. And so half of Pakistan is 23 or younger and the vast majority of that audience is using social media platforms to get their information because if they rely on the government, they'll get only the government narrative. So that's what's actually spreading around the world. It's, it's countries taking over the narrative and depriving citizens of the ability to have information where they might be critical of the government that is usually illegitimately in power. Um, and so what we do uh, with Voice of America is that we report in those countries using all platforms, using television, radio, and increasingly and much more aggressively social media platforms so that we can tell the story and people can get to the truth. And that's very upsetting to these, these uh, dictators. So in, in Cambodia and Vietnam, we had journalists thrown in jail, evicted from the country. We had our bureau in, in Islamabad shut down. Um, lots of very, very dangerous situations for our journalists around the world as they're confronting some of these places where truth is considered you know, the enemy. And VOA reported that routinely denied visas in China. Oh, right. my own experience. Yeah, absolutely. Reporting from there. Absolutely. And our agency, the U.S. Agency for Global Media, there's actually five major networks around the world. VOA is the largest. Radio Free Europe is second. Then we have Radio Free Asia, the Middle East Broadcasting Networks, and then we broadcast into Cuba on uh, the Martis. Um, but to, to answer your, your question, it sounds a little basic. But what's missing in these countries is fact-based, independent, original reporting and investigative reporting. And then we're also getting into the fact-checking genre as well. We have an English and a Russian language fact-checking site that's up and running. It's grown 500% this year in terms of usage, both the Russian language and the English fact-checking. So we're, we're not just doing long-form investigative stories and reporting on the day's news. Now, now we're doing, you know, in real time, like you were doing with the pointer, fact checking the Kremlin when the Kremlin comes out and says, uh, you know, those those little green soldiers in eastern Ukraine, they're not Russians, but we have video taken from a citizen journalist that proved they were Russians and it went out directly onto the social media platform that's in Russia, in Russian, and two million people viewed a video that proved that they were Russian soldiers on the Eastern Ukraine. You use the word proof, and I want all of us to address that question, 
because you and I can say that video proves it, but it's because you and I trust Elliot Higgins or Bell and Cat and the people who are these citizen journalists who have used powerful satellite technology to crowdsource and amass real-time data. We trust their reporting, um, but not everybody does. And we now have this whole AI, you know, artificial intelligence, deep fakes, all sorts of ways that you can, some of you may have seen it, you can Google it, it's not even new, it's a few years old. Some video that was made of George Bush and Vladimir Putin saying, and the maker of this deep fake just said words and it made them look like they were saying it. So there's a lot of stuff out there that people can cast down on. They can say, well, that doesn't prove anything to me because I don't trust the source. Well, that, what you're raising now, and I'm glad that we brought up AI and machine learning because it, like anything, like a gun on a table, it can be a weapon for defense or a weapon of terrorists. Um, the same is true with AI, and to your point, machine learning, where the next 2.0 level of propaganda will be just what you're saying, that there may be somebody you're conversing with on a social media platform that really doesn't even exist. Uh, they're, they're a made-up individual that understands all of your interests and, and, you know. We see that to a lesser degree with bots on Twitter yeah, exactly. who target journalists. I shouldn't say who, I should say that, because yeah. they're not real humans. But, um, you know, I have had certain columns go up that were then attacked by bots. And when I try to engage and answer the question, and then it comes back with nothing, someone else jumped into my Twitter feed and said, this is a bot, Indira. <laughs> you know, just ignore it. <laughs> but they, they make the bot seem very human. Yeah. So. Um, so, but I mean, how do you address that question of what is credible when not everybody agrees on a standard of proof? And, and yeah. things could be deep fakes. Well, first of all, we, we check the credibility. We just don't hope for the best. So currently, we. 85% of our audiences around the world find our information credible. So part of that goes back to the, that it's verifiable, that there are facts that can be proven on some level, setting aside the danger of AI where facts will be easier to, to mask in the future. That's a real danger. Um, so part of it is, is that, and, and it goes back to the original question is, why aren't we doing propaganda? Because that credibility is the thing that is only gonna you know, support us in the end. Um, and then, and then as we look at uh, investments with our partners around the world, so we're part of an organization called the DG7, and that means we're allied with the six other major de democracies and their government-supported uh, media, uh, France Media Mon, for example, we work with. And we, we meet with them twice a year, and we talk about how can we be a force multiplier for one another, how can we support each other in really difficult places around the world. Um, we work on internet freedom. We help bring internet circumvention technology and tools to bear in, in, in important places like Iran. When the Iran uh, riots broke out in early January last year, we saw our ability to get people a, uh, a, a platform like Telegram so they could get around and circumvent it, circum uh, vent around the government's uh, uh, ability to keep them away from the truth. And, and here's a really interesting thing that we've learned recently, and that is just showing audiences in repressed societies live content is something that is very novel for them because content is rarely live in places like Russia and Iran and China. It's heavily edited or it's just not even there. So the protests, for instance, around the Russian elections in Moscow were not covered in the media, but we were able to use social media platforms to show them, not just cover them, but show them happening live. Same with the Iranian prote protests in January. You're referring back to 2011 in Russia, those protests? Because those were, of course, what some people say got Hillary Clinton in trouble with Putin. Yeah. That she was, uh, you know, on a trip. I was actually on a trip with her covering that trip. And she made comments about the protests. And yeah. ever since then, he's carried a major grudge. <laughs> yeah. So, but just to wrap up that point, so credibility in, in is, is really something you gain when you're able to bring an audience something that they know is unedited and it's actually happening, and then they notice that it's not being run in their state media, and it helps build your credibility. Jean-Baptiste, we're talking a lot about interference around elections, but that's not the only form of disinformation that we see out there. Tell us what other forms you've studied of disinformation, and where else is it corrosive and a threat to democracy, even when it's not specifically around elections? 
if I have just a small remark on the defects, uh, what worries me more than a, a completely new and fake speech, uh, which is kind of easy to deny, like I never, I never pronounce this speech, is a modified speech, is you take a real speech, you cut only one small piece, you change only one small slice of that speech, you modify one mode, or what you can do is 20 versions of the same speech and we release all the 20 versions on the internet and then it's really difficult to retrieve which one is the original one. And the effect on the population is just that they don't believe in what you are releasing anymore. Um, so deep fakes are really worrying for a lot of reasons. Um, it's true that we focus on the elections, but um, the, the problem with focusing on the election is that we focus only on one kind of uh, influence operations that we're seeing, which are short-term operations. I'm not saying that elections don't have long-term consequences, but it's a short-term operation in the sense that, that it's an event. It's an event, right? Others of the same category are, for example, a crash, MH17, it's an event. Uh, assassination attempt, script up, or assassination successful. Uh, other cases, um, an accident, a uh, natural catastrophe, these are short-term manipulations that we see, and these are the ones that get uh, the most uh, coverage um, and analysis from uh, all the debunking websites, and, and it's perfectly fine. But aside from this, we have long-term influence operations, and these ones are trying to shape the minds and to shape and modify the political landscapes of countries by supporting not a political party during an election, but supporting their electoral base okay. every day. Not once every four or five years, every day. So tell us how that's happening in the US. Give us, uh, give us some local examples here. Well, in the US, I don't know. Um, I, or in I, France. I know, I, I'm, I'm not an expert on, uh, on, uh, on the US, but the, the you know, what, what you see in the US or what you see in Europe, what, what we've seen in, uh, in, in Northern Europe, for example, in Sweden, is always the same thing, is um, uh, you know, manipulating very socially divisive issues by, for example, pitting communities against, against each other. Uh, you know, the Russians or against like, immigrants. Or against right. immigrants, but you can uh, even support both sides of the debate, and that's what they do. Uh, Russians today, they are much more ideologically flexible than, than the Soviets. Uh, they don't care about consistency, about being consistent in, uh, in, in life. It, it's why it's, it's really different from propaganda. It's not propaganda. Propaganda is like an alternative version of the world. It's not an alternative version of the world that they want to push. It's a negative attitude that is just going to try to divide and weaken. And if you want to divide and weaken, what you need to do is to pit communities against each other. So, so sowing chaos. Sowing Basically, chaos. the idea is sowing chaos, and yes. it doesn't necessarily mean supporting one or the other. No, this you're, is you're interesting both. because we've seen this also, certainly in the U.S. sphere. We've seen fake information, disinformation coming in both to the left political sphere and to the right. And so you see these hyper-partisan websites on both sides of the political aisle. It's the extremes who have been fed by these Reddit threads, fed by things like, I'm naming 4chan and QAnon because they're the most famous, but there are plenty on the left that, um, that have fed all sorts of conspiracy theories that aren't true also. All right, so how can Europe, how can we transatlantically, what can the US and its European allies, including France, I would say, you know, maybe led by France since you had a successful experience after your election, what can we do to work together to fight this kind of disinformation? So that, that's the difficult issue of international cooperation. Uh, I think before going international, we should resolve the issue of uh, the internal cooperation between our own agencies. Like in the US, you have a lot of resources devoted to fighting uh, information manipulation, uh, global engagement center uh, within the state departments, uh, various task forces within uh, justice or homeland security, intelligence services. The main issue is coordination. You first need to uh, better coordinate you, like us, between all these internal agencies before going international. So we have first an issue about intra-cooperation. Then we can talk about inter-cooperation. And I think a forum like the G7 uh, could be useful, and they already uh, announced a new, um, rapid uh, alliance mechanism, 
uh, that, uh, that is uh, interesting, but it's not everyone. Um, you can do interesting things with NATO. NATO is already doing uh, interesting uh, things in a center like the Riga Stratcom uh, Center of Excellence. So there are already some hubs in Riga, in Brussels. Um, uh, Washington, D.C., you have interesting uh, you know, events like the uh, uh, Atlantic Council, uh, Stratcom, uh, annual events like uh, Netflix. I'll be back for that reason. Um, so these are interesting places where you can share. But concretely, every day, it's only at the bilateral level, I believe, because these issues are so sensitive and they imply most of the time intelligence sharing. Yes. So bilateral relations should be the starting point. We can do stuff in uh, G7, NATO, EU, but as I said, NATO, EU, you have, like NATO, you have Turkey. Uh, EU, you have also uh, countries like, uh, you mentioned Poland, but there's also the issue of Hungary, uh, with Romania. Albania. Um, Romania, uh, Cyprus, and Greece, who are, which are quite sympathetic to uh, the uh, Russian interests sometimes, or more than we would expect. Um, so, too many, you can't do much. Bilateral relation should be the first step. All right, before we open it up to questions, I just want to give Dukayan a chance to say, you know, you gave us a kind of dim uh, view of how Silicon Valley doesn't really want to solve the problem. It's not necessarily in their interest because their business model is engaging us as long as possible, advertising to us, targeting us. And so, you know, yeah, okay, this is collateral damage, disinformation, but really cleaning it up would involve an entire change to their business model. Is there any good news you can pick out from us from your time at Silicon Valley? Is there anything that business is doing to try to fix this? We know in Europe they're being forced to by the hand of regulation. That has obviously not happened here um, in the US. Is there something that business can or should be doing, particularly on this side of the Atlantic, short of regulation? Uh, well, that, that's, it's, a, it's a difficult question. It touches on the, the types of things we were talking about earlier. Uh, I think that for the most part, uh, at least from what I've seen, the industry is still uh, trying its best to kind of skate over the interests of the people and um, work around Washington, D.C., work around um, the, uh, the uh, let's say, the, the, the policy priorities that are being put forward by by Washington and, and, and also uh, to the extent that uh, international governments and jurisdictions are trying to push policy on the industry, those jurisdictions as well. Um, a good example of this is, uh, is with the Honest Ads Act. The Honest Ads Act is a very simple bill in the United States uh, which says that uh, the, the, the disclosure requirements in radio and broadcast need to be brought to the internet. That is that um, when, when we've all seen political ads on television where a candidate goes up on a commercial and ends it by saying this, this, this ad was paid for by my campaign. Uh, and the, the Honest Ads Act would, be, uh, would, would institute a, a, a similar analog for digital display advertisements on the internet and force advertisers to have to say uh, where they're coming from, where their funding is coming from, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and so uh, a few senators, Mark Warner, uh, Amy Klobuchar, and John McCain, were pushing this legislation in the U.S. And for the longest time, the industry was, was in uh, stark opposition to it, mostly privately. Um, that is to say, they weren't asked about it publicly all that much, uh, but uh, in, in, in private terms with the senators and, and uh, in, in other discussions, uh, they were, they basically said, look, um, this doesn't really have much political weight behind it. It's, it, it would be meaningful, but it, it, it doesn't, it's, it's not going to move. And um, until and unless you are able to prove that it'll move, uh, why, should we, why should we support such a measure? It cuts into our potential revenues. Well, by the way, ads is just one thing. It doesn't address content which is not paid content, but is being pushed out by 
goodness knows who, and is often very dishonestly pushed out. You think it's coming from one source, or you think it's from, you know, the Denver Guardian, or make up, fill in the blank, but it's actually some Macedonian teenagers, or teenagers trying to get money on penny clicks for those eyeballs going to a salacious article that they completely made up and they want to just make money for sneakers. So that, the Honest Ads Act, wouldn't actually address the content, the fake content problem. But I'm sure people in our audience have a lot of questions. We have two microphones here, right here and right here. So um, if you could stand up and identify yourself um, before asking a question, that would be great. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Ilan. And I would want to ask a question. I'm sorry, uh, are you a, just tell us, are you a student? Yeah, I'm a student, yes. Okay. So uh, my question is, what would be the line between upholding truth, particularly in the case of Google and Facebook, uh, upholding the truth and censorship? Because obviously there's a danger that if we start banning information because we believe it's false, then there's like a it, it can lead us a path where we start censoring information just because we disagree with it. So what would be the dividing line between those two things? Thank you, Ella. Um, Dipayan, do you want to take that since I'm sure it's something that came up a lot? Yeah, um, sure, sure. Uh, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a million dollar question. I, I think billion dollar question or maybe even more for, for Facebook right now and for companies in the industry. They're trying to answer exactly that. Uh, where do we set this line because if it's us setting it somewhere in the political spectrum, then uh, again, one side is gonna hate us for it, uh, the other side is going to uh, say, why didn't you get here earlier? Um, I, I think uh, if, we're, if we're talking about disinformation, um, we, we have to, as, as John was, was uh, uh, discussing earlier, we have to premise the decisions that we make based on what we can prove. What is the truth? Um, but that's not really that's not that's not uh, very illustrative. Um, I, I think uh, I think it's just a very difficult question, and, and it's it's something that uh, that these companies are definitely trying to address right now. Um, but it, what what they're trying to do is, I think, the right place to start, which is to design uh, algorithms. Uh, that, that can uh, assess and analyze all the information that is, uh, that is moving over these platforms uh, in real time and try to check uh, against, uh, against the actual facts of the situation uh, using uh, third-party fact checkers and other services. Um, and then where there's a discrepancy in, let's say, the truth of what's being reported, uh, actually institute a, a flag, raise a flag for a human reviewer. The human reviewer, and these companies are hiring tens of thousands, thousands of people um, to, to do, do this job, uh, the human reviewer would then check it and, and check whether or not this, this passes a certain barrier. And if it does, then uh, decide to, to take it down. The question you're asking is where is that barrier? I think I think we have to we have to premise it really in what's the what's the provable truth. Thanks. Do we have a question on this side? Yes. Uh, hi, I'm Anthony Price. I'm a student at the Cal University of America. I think your mic is not working. Oh. Good question. I mean, we've seen a lot of false information spread on social media that has incited violence against minority groups. Um, we've seen it in India um, between Muslims and Hindus. We've seen it in Myanmar over the Rohingya. Um, I mean, that must be something that VOA 
um, Radio Free Asia and others are working very hard to tamp that down, that yeah. kind of misinformation. It's a, it's a great question. Let's start with the Rohingya uh, situation where they're a Muslim minority in, minor in, in Myanmar and Burma for centuries and, and really just made up stories were being put out there that were putting them increasingly in a negative light to the point that violence has erupted and villages were being burned down. Um, and it's not the first time, it's, this isn't modern times, this is what happened to the, to the Jews in Germany. Well, not to mention the Salem witch trials. Right, the, the Salem witch trials. It's, mean... a, it's a tried and true way to, to persecute minorities and often it gets out of hand like this. Um, what, what we're trying to do, we're, Amanda Bennett, who's the director of The Voice of America and a two-time Pulitzer winning uh, editor, uh, and who I'm very proud to work with, she came up with a really novel approach. She's created something she's calling Refugee Radio. And so we're installing uh, small FM radio transmitters in refugee camps in some of the worst, most difficult places in the world, like Rohingya and in Kenya and in, uh, in Yemen. Somalia, she told me Somalia, also. Yeah. And so it allows us to get content into those refugee camps and hopefully tap, tamp down the disinformation with a flood of truthful information that we can provide. That doesn't necessarily help us tamp down the majority of, in those countries and the persecution coming from the majority, but it certainly allows us to report both in those, which we do with Radio Free Asia and Voice of America throughout Burma, but also now we're in those camps and also reporting directly to the refugees. Well, Amanda actually told me about this idea, which is a fantastic idea, but told me that Congress has not approved the budget for it yet. Oh, we'll get there. But, okay, oh, yeah. that has, you haven't got the budget for it yet. Yeah, well, nobody has it yet, yeah, because we're at an impasse. But I, I'm fully confident we had a great meeting with the appropriators and they really like this idea. So okay. it'll, it'll get funded. Yes, please, jump back to you. Just looking at some that, I just wanted to mention that sometimes the governments of these countries, so you mentioned uh, Burma, but uh, India, Sri Lanka, Indonesia, uh, have the same kind of uh, issues. They have more radical solutions, which is to just get access to some of the digital platforms for a certain time. Um, in uh, May and June in India, in only two months, they got 15 persons lynched, killed in, uh, in uh, separate uh, uh, you know, incidents. Yes. Uh, and so the Indian government uh, decided to suspend access to WhatsApp, mm -hmm. which was the main uh, digital platform used to spread these false rumors yeah. about uh, this guy is a child rapist or, uh, or any any rumors. Or this guy a cow. Yeah. yeah. Or, right? Yeah, right. Right. Yeah, right. Um, so this, that's more uh, radical but only temporary uh, solution. And they just named a woman yesterday to the post of a uh, content moderator for WhatsApp India. And a lot of people were commenting on the Twitter sphere, that's a tough job. <laughs> that's not a job. Okay, can we get the microphone over to this gentleman here who um, wanted to ask a question before and then we'll, we'll come to you next. Yes, hi, I'm Anthony. I'm a uh, student at the Catholic University of America. And I was, a doc I was identifying with something that was uh, brought up earlier when it came to narrative control or making sure that the, make sure that the true narrative came out, uh, and that is a provable truth. Um, it reminded me of something uh, that happened in the United States with the Ludlow Massacre, where uh, which massacre? The Ludlow Massacre okay. happened in the 1800s, -ish, um, where uh, multiple workers were on strike, and then uh, there, were, there was a massive outcry for what was true. Um, the company that was behind it had to um, had to more or less bend facts to say that it was a struggle for freedom and of industry that was happening in Colorado, as opposed to the fact that they just killed 16 uh, workers who were striking. Um, so my question, uh, second from this, is that uh, lives for, um, for American corporations would not be on, on the line in the same way. But however, uh, when it comes to controlling narrative and, uh, and proving truth, how do we get corporations who, it may not be in their commercial interest to initially start investigating it, how do we make them care and, and act in a way that would um, help the cause for, uh, for finding proof? Well, this was partly what Dupayan was talking about before, that there's a commercial disincentive if the only question is to maximize engagement time and the ability to target all of us 
as advertising, as people for advertising. So I don't think there is a solution to that at the moment. This is what it seems like the Europeans are trying to do with regulation. Jean-Baptiste, maybe you could tell us a little bit about what the Europeans are trying to do with regulating Google and Facebook and all the platforms and whether you think it will be successful. Honestly, um, I can't really talk about that because I'm not uh, really competent on this uh, specific issue of digital platforms. But from what I understand, uh, we are having an even harder time than you um, uh, in, in this relationship between states and digital platforms. Uh, it's very really difficult to uh, convince them to do something. Um, more uh, substantial than uh, what they're already doing and what they've already been doing for uh, some months and even some years. Um, uh, so maybe naming and shaming uh, would be efficient. Uh, we need to find, way, find ways to pressure them more. Um, but at the same time, do we really want to weaken them if they're too weak, even though you can say hey, it's too big to be really weakened, but uh, what what's are the alternatives? Uh, and maybe the alternatives are not from the West. Maybe uh, if uh, we use any engineering to edge, uh, Chinese companies, that would benefit to Chinese companies, for example, mm -hmm. on, in the long term. So we need to find the right balance. Yeah. All right, there's a lady here with a question. Hi, my name is Contessa Bourbon. I write for the London Times. Thank you for this informative uh, forum. I'd like to ask the panelists, do you think it is unconstitutional, unconstitutional for um, government officials to block uh, comments of uh, people in some social media like uh, Facebook or Twitter? What is your view? Are you talking about a specific thing that's happening in the Philippines? It, they are blocking the, the government the, is blocking the government officials blocking some um, some um, comments from the from social media and there's a case being tried in B and B area. I know of the case where government officials are preventing citizens from following them. For example, following them on social media, and that's that has been seen as an attack on our. First Amendment freedoms that if we can't engage with officials, but which officials are blocking comments? I'm not aware of that. Maybe just tell us briefly what you're talking about. I'm not exactly familiar about it, but uh, it's, there's a case in this area filed, and it is uh, to, to, to rule if it's unconstitutional, unconstitutional to block people from because there's a software that you can block comments. Yeah, I think you're talking about blocking people from following you. There is that case going on. That there's the whole, it was filed by, wasn't it the um, Jafar's group at Columbia University, the First Amendment Night Center? I think they filed a case saying that it's unconstitutional for government officials like President Trump to block um, he, he was blocking people who he didn't like, who were making comments. I think that's what you're talking because about. By, by blocking, then you prevent somebody from Then you prevent them from, well, they, you prevent them from hearing people also. Well, yeah, I mean, that's the point you made. Yeah, that then, then, that then that government, of, then that citizen can't um, hear what the government official is saying on Twitter because they've been blocked and also can't be heard. Um, yeah, sure, I was just gonna respond quickly. Uh, this is uh, Jamil Jaffer, who uh, leads the, the Knight Foundation at, at Columbia. Um, yeah, I, I think that it's a it's a it's an open question as to where people should stand on that on that question. Um, but I, I think uh, I think for the companies, they, they are they're they're still in this area where where they just are not sure what to do because they, they want to shift the responsibility outward. And, and going back to the, to the earlier question about commercial interest as well, and what, uh, what maybe we should do in the United States, or what a government like France or, or the European Union should do uh, going forward. Um, this, this industry is, is built to the interests, to, to, is, is built to uh, benefit the advertisers. Uh, in other words, the, 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 a lot, there's, a, there's an absolute 
if, if a disinformation operator uh, comes onto a platform as an advertiser or somebody who is trying to push content, that is, that is the type of organization that, that social media companies like Facebook are trying to host. And you could say in certain ways that the interests of Facebook and the interests of the disinformation operator are absolutely one and the same, aligned, you could say. And that goes for any of these companies, whether it's YouTube or Twitter. Um, what do you do in this situation where their interests are aligned and, and it's not in their, necessarily in their interest to work in the public interest? That is, to block disinformation or to uh, take hate speech, propagate, fear hate speech propagators off their platform. Uh, well, I think that, that from evidence, what I was saying, trying to say earlier about the, about the Honest Ads Act is that people have been pushing and pushing and pushing for several years now. And not until Cambridge Analytica happened did the industry come and say, okay, we'll support it. But even now they're saying that, uh, privately they're saying that they're, they're lobbying against it, essentially. And so I think, that, I think that it's time for the government to regulate. It's time for the government to really study the business model and adjust it in a way that uh, can protect the public interest, protect their, these companies' commercial success going forward, uh, and work for democracy as, as opposed to help fester a fire at the feet of democracy. Do we have time for any more questions? Okay. There's a... Uh, young woman over here. Yes, you. Yeah, go ahead. Can we? Do we have a microphone that we can get to her? Uh, he handed me a microphone. But I, I'll be real quick. Okay, sure. Thank you. Um, my name is Fred Michelle. I'm an historical researcher slash businessman uh, from Central Maryland, and um, I I have connections with Connecticut, so I'm not shedding a tear that Alex Jones got canceled on Twitter, okay? Uh, although I do like Paul Joseph Watson, that's another story. Um, here's my question, just in, in, in the interest of brevity. Uh, Alex Jones got his Twitter account canceled. The other night we had a sitting United States Senator, an Hispanic American in the state of Texas, getting harassed by a group uh, in a Washington, D.C. restaurant along with his wife, and yet, as of this morning, there, I think the group is called Free Washington Radical or Free Washington something. Their Twitter account is, is still existing. So what is it going to take, is my question, for someone like Federal Communications Commission Chairman Pai to contact Twitter and say, look, if you don't do something about this hate speech that's been posted, we will. I'm not familiar with that group. I know the incident you're talking about, about Ted Cruz being yes. pushed out of a restaurant or chased out of a restaurant, but I'm not aware of this particular um, group that you're saying and what they say on their Twitter account, so it's hard. I don't think any of us know about that Twitter account, so it's hard for us to comment, but the larger point you make that Twitter has been of all the social media platforms the slowest to act in terms of booting off people of any political persuasion who are engaged in hate speech or lies is true. Twitter has been the slowest to, to react to that, but we can't comment on that particular one because we don't know about it. All right, the young woman over here. Uh, good evening, uh, I'm Fanny, I'm an assistant professor at uh, John Hawkins Sites. So John, uh, John Lancer, you used the phrase uh, like uh, we are at war or this is a war that we're having against those who spread uh, disinformation and mostly uh, Russia. I was wondering, uh, Jean-Baptiste, would you use the same rhetoric? And then to uh, both speakers, what do you think it changes whether you use the rhetoric of war or something else in terms of the strategy that you're going to use to respond? Just to be accurate, it was actually John Lansing was quoting the late John McCain oh, right. as having yes, said yes, exactly. that it was a so war. So I just want to be accurate here. We're talking about no fake news, no disinformation. So I just want to get the quote right. So John McCain said it was a war. But I do know that many people in the US government certainly see it as uh, it's war by another means. It's war not using bullets. It's war using information. And it's not just government officials who think that. A lot of Russia experts in this country certainly think that as well. Well, the attack on the 2016 election originated in the military yes. wing of the, of the crime. GRU, yeah. right? I mean, you were talking about the GRU being behind so many of these 
um, attacks, but what about rhetoric? What about the language we choose? Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. I used to say that it's just rhetoric. And because it's just rhetoric saying we are at all or not, we can say it or we cannot without any legal implications. Um, therefore, if, uh, it can be a political act to say we are at war against terrorism, against jihadists in the Sahel, uh, in, uh, in the Middle East. Um, we won't say we are at war with Russia. We can say we are at war um, because this kind of action is a declaration of war, but it's just a manner of speaking. It does not have any legal implications because war is a war that you don't find in legal language. Uh, if you, we find, we, we talk about armed conflict, international conflict or non-international conflict. And this is not an international conflict, in my opinion, or a non-international conflict, more, most obviously, because it does not uh, reach the threshold of uh, violence and organization. And also we cannot prove command and control um, uh, because the attribution is never sure at 100%. Um, and that's maybe a difference between France and the US. Uh, when the US are officially blaming Russia, uh, France did not officially... With a high degree of certainty, whereas the official intelligence agency language, intelligence community language, high degree of certainty. Yeah, 16 agencies. Yeah. Yes, so we, we did not do that in France. Uh, so that's the issue of attribution. And if you do not attribute, you cannot say you're at war, or you're at war with an unknown enemy. Um, so I would not say we are at all, or I would use it only in a speech uh, as a uh, you know, rhetorical, uh, just to uh, you know, uh, try to uh, uh, motivate the troops. Uh, but it's, it's political speech, it's political communication, it has, nothing, it has no legal implications. Uh, one last thing is that on the Russian side, they are talking about information warfare. They have the wording information warfare in their doctrine, and they see cyber operations as only a part of information warfare. So they have documents about information warfare. Uh, it's in the glossary of the um, Joint uh, Armed Chief of Staff. Um, so they are using this rhetoric. Uh, it would be a reason why we should or we could use the same rhetoric only by symmetry, saying if they consider that this is an act of war, we are not saying that it's our decision, but we are just describing the fact that from their point of view, it is an act of war. So it's a reason to use it maybe, but personally, I would not say it's an act of war. It's an act of hostility, if, uh, it's an act of uh, uh, conflictuality, but war, I think, is, is too strong or too vague. Um, all right, I'm just going to ask um, Dupayan and the next person to just wrap up, give us your last takeaway. If there's one takeaway that you want everyone to get from the, from, you know, talking about the threat of disinformation to democracy, what's your one takeaway? Yeah, I think, uh, I think that disinformation is going to come forward and, and, and continue uh, to be a problem. In fact, I don't think disinformation is going away. There are two, two sides to this. There's the infrastructure supporting disinformation, and there are the people that are pushing disinformation. Uh, the only power that we have right now is over that infrastructure. And until and unless we break the economic logic that's behind that infrastructure, that's at the heart of the internet, until and unless we, we make changes through regulatory policy that can address uh, the uninhibited collection of data and the, the use of that data to push uh, through money uh, messaging that can, that can really cut at the heart of our democratic institutions, we're not going to be getting anywhere on this problem. Jean-Baptiste. Uh, just if you want to know more information on manipulation, you can find this uh, report that we just released online on the uh, French website of the uh, MFA and MOD, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ministry of Defense. So it's a 200 page long. Uh, I have no time, obviously, to tell you uh, about the contents, uh, but we have 50 concrete recommendations, so you'll find it online. It's Thank called, you. and give us the full title. And it's the Information yes. Manipulation, a Challenge for Our Democracy, because we use the word information manipulation. We defend the terminology inside. We don't like fake news for the yeah. Same reasons that you uh, said at the beginning. We should ban the word. <laughs> All right. 
Good. Although I'm not into word banning, so please <laughs> don't take that the wrong way. It was a joke. It was a joke. I didn't mean we should ban anything. I would just wrap up by saying that uh, I think what we've learned over the last two years is that democracies are fragile, that they are reliant upon an agreed upon set of facts, and that institutions are reliant upon a simple belief that institutions like the Supreme Court will make free and fair judgments, or institutions like the Justice Department are not corrupt. And once belief in institutions goes away, I would suggest it's really, really hard to get it back. And so this is something, if you're on the left or the right or the center or independent or in the Green Party, everybody has an interest in understanding the value of a verifiable, believable set of facts. All right, please join me in thanking our panelists. For